Chimere is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. As the asteroid which concluded the Mesozoic never struck Chimere, dinosaurs remain the dominant terrestrial megafauna. Chimere is a dangerous place, and the rivers are no exception. Fish are a highly nutritious source of food. Crocodiles, dinosaurs, birds, big cats, bears, and people all gather by the water for their piece of the pie. Though fish are a foundational component of freshwater ecosystems, it should be no surprise that some giants bite back. Although there are over a thousand species of freshwater fish just in the known world, in today's episode we will meet 12 of the most infamous and dangerous fish encountered by the peoples of Chimere. First up is the dire piranha of the Ceritic wetlands. This habitat is a vast, slow-moving river with thousands of lakes scattered throughout, spanning an area around half the size of the Amazon River Basin. An especially harmful flow of algal and magic blooms from a phosphorus deposit six million years ago wiped out many indigenous species, and the subsequent harvest from Miocene South America populated most of the fish we see there today. Perhaps the most notorious of the fish harvested at this time were the piranhas. Although modern species had yet to evolve, a massive 70 centimeter piranha, creatively called Mega Piranha, was among those harvested and brought to the Ceritic wetlands. It is now assumed that the dire piranha is their descendant, but based on their proportions and more derived single row of teeth, some assembly naturalists think they came from smaller ancestors and reached this size of a meter or more and weight of nearly 100 pounds independently. Like red piranhas of Earth, the dire piranha has a formidable reputation, not fully supported by reality. They do travel in shoals and are recorded to attack and kill swimmers, but the numbers are mostly for predator defense, and they only attack opportunistically. They are primarily omnivores or scavengers, and would much rather eat the flesh of ceritic ibu fruits than that of people. Plenty of experienced fishermen claim that they can pass through a group unharmed, although if a shoal happens upon a person splashing nearby, especially if that swimmer is injured, the attack can be swift, bloody, and quickly lethal. Another resident of the Ceritic wetlands whose ancestor was harvested during the Miocene of South America was the mighty Arapaima. On Earth, Arapaima are voracious small game hunters who often reach 6 feet in length, can still reach 10 feet in extreme cases, and historically may have exceeded 15 feet before modern fishing pressures reduce their natural size and population potential. Living in more plentiful habitat, and generally being too large for Chimerian fishermen to tackle on a notable scale, the ceritic species of Arapaima regularly exceeds 15 feet, with the largest individuals in the deeper lakes sometimes reaching a staggering 23 feet, or 7 meters. Although they generally don't target people, many fishermen have been killed trying to harpoon and vanquish these armored torpedoes of scale and muscle, but according to legend, the residents of the Great Lakes will sometimes topple a canoe and feed upon the rowers within. After all, to a two-ton Arapaima, people certainly qualify as small game. Another iconic resident of the Ceritic wetlands is the Crocodile Gar, although they are found in lesser numbers throughout the wetlands of the known world. The ancestors of this voracious and adaptable predator may have come through the Oligocene Harvest, or one of the more recent, from North America. Gar derived at such a slow pace, it is difficult to predict. 
Exceptional specimens can exceed 15 feet in length. Despite their formidable jaws and teeth that can grow longer than a human finger, they generally avoid people. They are only a few attacks on people and no recorded killings. They much prefer smaller fish and the occasional aquatic mammal or bird, but nothing larger than around 50 pounds. Children should not swim near them, of course, but there are so many dangers in the Cerritic wetlands that the crocodile gar doesn't even come close to ranking in the top threats. Crocodile gar are taken as game fish, where most injuries do occur, and although their meat isn't prized, it can feed a small village on its own. For most of the year, to the north of the Cerritic wetlands is a vast, arid prairie with only a few rivers providing the northern tributaries to the Great Lakes. However, for a few months a year, this housey prairie becomes a vast floodplain, and the usually homogeneous arid gold becomes a lush glade of diverse shallow marshland. In this time, many herbivores migrate from thousands of miles away to gorge themselves on the seasonal bounty. Billions of insects mate, adding to the incalculable trophic base that supports countless species. Once the bounty flows down to the Cerritic wetlands or through the Chikachi River into the Crescent Sea, most animals follow the water or migrate back to their distant pastures. One species of fish, however, makes the perhaps surprising decision to remain on the prairie year-round, the housey lungfish. For a vast majority of their lives, which can be well over a century, housey lungfish are shelled up in a buried cocoon of mucus. As their name implies, they can breathe air, which they do through a small tunnel up to the surface. Housey lungfish make a quarter of a century to reach maturity, but once they do, they reproduce on a massive scale. The female will mate with as many males as possible, leaving each with a clutch of eggs he will incubate within his cocoon. When the next flood arrives, sometimes nine months later, but occasionally a few years go by if a drought passes through, the male will emerge with hundreds of tadpoles. Female housey lungfish can reach lengths of 10 feet or 3 meters, although these are only the centennials, and most adults are a more conservative 5 feet long. Giant lungfish have killed a few shoe during the wet season, but they are most likely hunting accidents, as their diet is primarily much smaller than people. Conversely, lungfish are prized by the shoe. During the dry season, especially in years where the storms never come, lungfish can provide both water and a highly nutritious meal, invaluable if you know where to dig. On the other side of the known world, in the temperate waters to the south, is home to the largest freshwater fish in Chimere, the skewerback sturgeon. Fossils of their dorsal osteoderms have been found in formation early in the Tyrant Dynasty, showing that they have changed very little in their millions of years in the known world. All 12 sturgeon species in the known world are well defended by tough dermal armor, but the high spines of skewerback sturgeons are particularly reliable defenses and deterrents. Most earth sturgeons see the absorption of their scutes with age, but perhaps in an effort to maintain these defenses into adulthood due to greater predatory pressures, the most successful chimerian sturgeons are neotinic, retaining visible armor and flattened heads as a consequence. There are many predators who view even adults as prey, and investing in armor well into adulthood has proved to be a successful strategy. When it is time to spawn, adults swim upriver in any of the thousand southern islands, southern Arvel, or Picardia. Fertilized caviar is laid in solid substrate. Young hatch and subsist on benthic invertebrates. Once they reach a few inches in length, they will add fish to their diet and an adult marine mammals, although unlike other large sturgeons, benthic prey like mollusks and crustaceans is often a majority of their diet perhaps due to these neotinic traits. Juveniles remain in freshwater habitats for at least their first year. Some remain indefinitely, although these rarely exceed a few meters in length. Although males often reach 15 feet and over a ton in weight, females have been found to reach truly staggering sizes. 
The largest verified by the assembly was 32 feet in length, and the Great Library has a skeleton which likely exceeded 40 feet in life. Even common females in the 20-foot range are still documented to attack and kill people. Their caviar is prized for its rich, buttery flavor, but harvesting is best done after Mother has returned to the sea. Sturgeons are not the only saltwater fish to venture into freshwater habitats. The carpenter shark, a distant cousin of Earth's sawfish, is a frequent visitor to estuaries and even far inland throughout the known world. They can be quite large, with some in the seagrass meadows exceeding 30 feet, although most in freshwater habitats are younger individuals in the 5 to 10 foot range. Even these pups can deliver a devastating cut with their serrated saws. They hunt benthic prey, but can be surprisingly aggressive even without provocation, and won't hesitate to slash at anyone who bothers them. Many anglers have attributed lost hands and legs to carpenter sharks, and the assembly records do include an account of a man being cut in half after several strikes against the surface. Throughout the range of southern freshwater habitats can be found the temperate counterpart to the crocodile gar, the musketeer pike. They can reach up to 10 feet in length in southern Arvel, but are far less aggressive than their reputation might suggest. There have been a few anglers killed by these predators, and Arvella folklore says they are among the mightiest of fish, but in general they are considered to be far less lethal than appearances might suggest. They were once quite common in Kajar, but persecution by fishermen led to localized extinctions in many river and lake systems. Another temperate freshwater giant is a subspecies of Wells catfish called the walrus eel. They are fairly recent arrivals to the known world, less than a million years. Although most do not exceed six feet, in waters without much competition and prey, which are now quite common in Kajar due to the persecution of musketeer pike, they can quickly attain massive sizes. In Kajar, specimens exceeding 10 feet are common, 15 well recorded, and the largest on assembly record was 22 feet in length. One village in Neroton Lands had a skull of Grandfather Shanksmonger on display. An alleged man-eater, Shanksmonger is said to have been 7 span, or 40 feet in length. The skull is quite massive, but assembly naturalist Dr. Charles Hartsfield said it couldn't have been longer than 25 feet, 20 more likely. A formidable animal to be sure, but as is often the case, quite exaggerated over time. An especially notorious fish in the highlands of Picardia is the giant or radiant snakehead. These thrust feeders hunt plankton as young, but quickly graduate to larger prey as they age. The largest specimens can exceed 7 feet long and do hunt young chimerans, although their impact on other fauna is more concerning to locals as their range has spread west. They are fast breeding, highly adaptable, and voracious. Giant snakeheads have recently come to Kajar, and their impact has been devastating. Countless lakes, which supported dozens of villages, have seen these fish move in, deplete local stocks, and move along. Culling efforts have been largely ineffectual due to how prolific they are. With pseudo-lungs and surprisingly low oxygen demand, they can crawl out of water for up to seven days in search of new territory if all tributaries are depleted. They have caused a number of injuries to chimerans, but this is largely a matter of statistical probability. No other fish inspires such aggression and boldness among chimeran anglers, and although few want to mess with a 500-pound snakehead, the alternative is seeing her entire livelihood depleted has inspired many to brave the murky waters with whatever weapon they can get their hands on. Musketeer pike are known to react fairly aggressively toward giant snakeheads, often besting them in direct confrontation, and Kadra fishermen have quickly taken a liking to these once reviled fish. When pike tackle adult snakeheads, and walrus eels pick off the small fry without interference from adults, the two fish have proven to be quite successful pair in clearing out snakeheads and restoring ecological stability from the freshwater ecosystems of the known world. Although the fish mentioned so far only occasionally kill people, there are three freshwater taxa which are notorious man-eaters. 
In the tropical jungles of Nikar and the Seritic wetlands, a voracious ambush hunter lurks among the fallen trees and other foliage to strike at unsuspecting prey. There are many names throughout their range, but the Great Library calls them Great Pouncers, a translation of their Chakati name. At first assumed to be a relative of the Goliath tigerfish of modern Africa, it seems they are descended from a distinct genus of related animals harvested back in the Miocene. They are not as swift as their Earth counterparts, but are quite covert and astonishingly lethal macro predators. As their name implies, fish of this genus are proficient ambush predators. They are fully capable of bringing down and dismembering large prey. As juveniles, they live in groups for protection. Many remain in these schooler morphs their whole lives. In a given region, some of these schoolers will grow massive, often taking on local apex predator niches within a local isolated lake or stretch of river. In this position, they grow enormous. Males regularly grow 6 feet in length and weigh over 200 pounds, while females often double their males' counterparts' weights and are 8 feet long. The largest ever recorded by naturalists of the assembly was a man-eater just under 12 feet long and 1,500 pounds. Great pouncers are formidable predators even as schoolers, but the giant predators are prolific man-eaters. Most seritic fishermen are lost to pouncers than any other fish combined, and even crocodiles claim fewer lives. Unfortunately, killing a large local pouncer is not especially effective, as any of the schoolers will quickly grow up to take their place, and with a heightened appetite of a growing predator. Other large hunters in the area can help suppress their size, so a bakar near the village is often better than trying to kill each pouncer individually. In the corresponding jungles and wetlands of Arvel, another large fish is a frequent hunter of people within their range, the ridgeback catfish. This menace lurks within the same channels carved by Kurujaku that locals must forage in for subsistence. They hunt at the bottom of fast-flowing cool waters in the Windward Highlands, which does put them in conflict with Arvela fishermen harvesting from these bountiful if treacherous waters. Many man-eaters seem to begin by following hooked fish, but others will lunge at fishermen wading in calm sections. Their massive jaw muscles power a vice-like bite which can break bone, integral in processing kills quickly when they have to worry about competition from crocodiles, several other large fish, and the very architects behind the channels they need to survive, the Kurojaku. The rivers of Picardia, which flow down from the mysterious highlands, are mostly slow-moving, punctuated by waterfalls. Although most freshwater fish in the known world are descended from recent harvests, the highland lakes of Picardia harbor many fish which trace their ancestry to harvests back during the Mesozoic or even earlier. An ancient lake with primordial horrors within. Jiraka has its roots in the language of the panther clans, but is known throughout the Picardian Confederacy. I am why you must go hungry, in reference to their occupation of slow-moving, shallow waters where highland fishermen prefer to harvest. Although they compete with fishermen for prey, anglers themselves are on the menu of the Shiraka. Their jaws are quite strong and rapid side-to-side -side shaking of prey can quickly dismember. They are solitary predators which often target large game, when tackling terrestrial prey, they can crawl out of the water when necessary to acquire, thanks to strong, clawed fins. They target limbs and drag them into deeper water for dismemberment and consumption. Survivors often suffer debilitating limb injuries, although it is rare to survive these attacks. Although Jiraka are hunted, consuming their meat is taboo, typical within Picardian cultures regarding the meat of man-eaters. The Jiraka shares territory with the Abagora, or Salmon Folk. Little is known of these beings, in fact they were only recently confirmed by the Assembly to exist. These people can assume the form of giant salmon Dalajada, that of conventional Chimerans, and unusual for skin changers, a form between. Although little is known about them, their hatred of Jiraka is well documented. 
Jaws of these horrible sarcoturigians are popular trophies for hunters and decorations outside the beaver-like lodges of the Abagora. Although water is core to all life, it also brings death. These are only some of the river monsters you might encounter. To those anglers who work with the assembly to assist in the breadth of scientific understanding of these fish by collecting specimens, I have only one thing to say. Good luck. Cheers to Glarn for sponsoring this episode. As I've done very little work on fish and chimere, it was a ton of fun to study and illustrate for. As many of you may have noted, I postponed this episode in an effort to get more art done, and it was still down to the wire. No regrets, of course, and I've learned a lot of fascinating extinct fish, others still with us today, and some critically endangered taxa as well. Lots more to learn, but it definitely made me excited to do more fish episodes and illustrations in the future. Thank you again to those who have joined my membership program. It's an easy way to financially support the project. Just click join button next to any of my episodes. Want to keep Chimera a project that doesn't require you to pay to enjoy, so there are no perks, just support. Even the lower tiers can go a long way in helping make ends meet and keep working on Chimera. Thanks again to Andrew, Red Lycan, and Thomas who have joined, and to those of you who already support me on Patreon, to Glarn for the sponsorship, and cheers to you for watching. Stay fantastic, everyone. Cheers, folks! Cheers, folks!